happy to see all of you here. We were wondering sometime in this week when we heard about all the people that were going to be gone on this first holiday weekend of the summer, we wondered, well, who's going to be here? And then we thought, well, we'll have faith. I know there'll be a lot of our faithful ones here, and certainly you are, and we're glad to have you. I wonder if we have any visitors who have not been given a visitor's card as they came in. If so, would you raise your hand? There's one down here but by Mrs. Beatty, Brother Glenn. Anyone else? All right, we're happy to have you visiting with us this morning. We pray and hope that you will find that it was good to have been here in the house of the Lord today. <coughs> I'm sure most of you have noticed our floral arrangement. Once again, we have Gertrude Bryant to thank for that, and we're grateful for that. We think it's very nice, it's a wonderful arrangement, very beautiful. We want to be remembering especially, this is on my heart, so I'll say it first, we want to be remembering especially our <coughs> pulpit committee today. <coughs> they are away from us, visiting another church, listening and talking with a pastor, a prospective pastor for our church. And we want to be very much in prayer for their work and for their efforts and pray for their safe return tomorrow. They'll be coming back over the holiday tomorrow and we want to pray that nothing will befall them on their return. But they, they feel that this man bears further looking into and they've talked with him a lot already and we should pray also that if this is the Lord's man, that he would show us and show them that fact. <clears throat> I would emphasize several things in the announcements. One is there'll be no youth choir practice tomorrow night. No youth choir practice tomorrow night. However, next Sunday afternoon there will be one at 5 o'clock because the youth choir is going to sing next Sunday evening for us. So you young people... Keep that in mind. Also, you'll notice on the top of the next page, page two or three, family work day. Now, we have a lot of things that need to be done here at the church in preparation for the summer, not the least of which is getting the air conditioners reconditioned and ready to go, as you will probably notice today. You probably notice it getting a bit warm even this morning. We do not have the air conditioners going yet, and we'd like to get them in shape next Saturday. We have some other things to do. The pastor's study needs to be cleaned. The parsonage needs to be cleaned. We have some carpet that needs to be looked at as a possibility of putting it in the ladies' classroom. There's lots of things that need to be done. So we're having a family work day. Everyone come and help. Bring your potluck lunch and just plan to stay through the noon hour. We'll have fellowship together at that time. And then we'll try to finish up what has to be done and get the church in as fine a shape as we possibly can. There is a possibility we'll have a preacher come in view of a call, maybe even the Sunday after next Saturday, and we want things to be in pretty apple pie order if we can have them that way when he comes. So you be sure to remember that announcement. Come early, stay late. I'll be here at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning, and I don't expect all of you to come at that hour, but if you can come that er early and start, maybe you only have a little time to spend by coming and do that. But let's put our shoulders to the wheel, so to speak. You know, I, I read a, a thing one time. It said, uh, put your nose to the grindstone, your shoulder to the wheel, and keep your eye on the ball, and then try to work in that position. And I don't know how you can do it either, but let's try it anyhow and be here next Saturday. <clears throat> Vacation Bible School, June 12th through 16th. Keep that in mind. And I think you can pretty well decide which of the other announcements are meant for you. Does anyone have an announcement that should be made this morning that I didn't get? I was teaching a class this morning, so I was not available. Anyone have any further announcement to make today? All right, in order that we can let our graduates relax a little bit, 
a little later we'll recognize them now. <laughs> we have really more than what's shown here. There are only four. How many are there altogether? Eight? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are eight graduates altogether. We are fortunate to have four of them with us today. You know, I'm not going to try to diminish the importance of what you have accomplished thus far in your lives. True, graduation from high school is just a first step, perhaps. But it's an important one, and it's a big one, and it's one that I think you need to be congratulated for. There are an awful lot of boys and girls these days who don't graduate even from high school. We're very pleased and proud that you've accomplished this. And we'll be looking forward to hearing some other great things from you as you begin your life away from maybe formal education or go on with your formal education, whichever you choose to do. But we're proud and happy that you were able to accomplish this part. And it's a wonderful time. It's a wonderful experience for you. It's one of the first big things that comes along in your life. Now, we could talk a lot about how, how great our high school days were, and we all remember how great they were when we were in high school, don't we? But you've got some greater days ahead, something to look forward to. You're just really getting a good start. So congratulations to all of you, and best of luck in the days ahead. Now, we have some gifts for you here. Uh, Jim, would you come and help me just a moment? Um, we have, I don't know who, where these other students are graduating from, but this morning we have three graduating from Highland and one from Manzano. Is that correct? I think that's right. Of the other graduates, if there are any of the relatives here of those graduates, I'd appreciate it if you would uh, let us know so that you can take this gift to them and save us having to uh, try to find them. But we do have these four. Would you... I think we all four of you just come right on up here, if you would, please. Rather than recognizing you individually, we'll recognize you as we give you the gifts. These are some of our fine young people, and only four of the eight that are supposed to be here, and we're happy for them. Uh, David Dingler. Matt Arthur. Jane Miller. We're happy to be able to recognize you as graduates. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Jim. Uh, one of the other graduates is Sandra Hallman. Mr. and Ms. Hallman, would you see that she gets her gift, please? And Sammy Fincher, is Ms. Fincher here? Would you take his to him, if you would, please? I'd appreciate it. Huh? That's all right. We don't need to know why he's not here. We'd just like for you to give it to him and tell him our heartfelt congratulations uh, from the church as a whole. We appreciate him and appreciate all of these fine graduates. All right, let us turn, if you will, then, to hymn number 428. 428.
privilege we have of giving of our tithes and offerings to you. We pray that you'll bless them and use them through this church for the ongoing of thy kingdom's work. In Jesus' name, amen. George, would you open the window? Let us turn to hymn number 439. 439. Oh 
Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to commune with thee. We pray that these prayers might be in the circle of your holy and wonderful will. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> you know, we're delighted this morning to have these instrumentalists here filling in for those who are gone. Glad to have David back from school so we can call on him occasionally to be of service. And I know he delights in doing it. Chris, we're happy for you too. Delighted. We're also happy to have Jim Fulmer come to preach for us. One of our own young men I've known since he was just a little fellow. And he's a real fine young man and he's a licensed preacher and we like to hear him preach. We'll be praying for you, Jim, as you come and bring the message in a few moments. <coughs> we uh, 
have a choir special, but we're going to save it for next week for several reasons, and I'm not going to tell you what all the reasons are. <coughs> but if you'll turn to a favorite of our organist this morning, she wanted us to sing 479, so we're going to sing her favorite this morning. She says, you never sing that song. Well, I said, we do too, but you just aren't here when we do it. 479. I will mention, though, some of you have heard me speak about my zither. I have a zither now. Actually, it's an auto harp, a fancy one with about 27 chords on it. If you'll come tonight, I'll play it and sing for you tonight. 479 right now on Jordan's Stormy Banks. through the streets singing that song, uh, things would happen, I'm sure. I'm sure. Mac, I'm going to come tonight, <laughs> just for that zither. That's why I'm going to be here. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you again for this time we can come together, help us to fall on our face and be grateful that we can have a Sabbath day to come and empty our hearts and fill us with the Holy Spirit. Dear Father, be with the people on our pulpit committee that they might have a safe journey and that they might be filled with the Spirit so they can have spiritual lives and choose the right spiritual leader for our church. And dear Father, this morning, I pray that you will use me, use my life, my voice, my mind, for your service and your glory. In your holy name, amen. Today I'm going to speak entirely from the Psalms. Well, my readings will be entirely from the Psalms. This little book is uh, called Psalms for Modern Man. Most of you probably have heard of Good News for Modern Man. Well, this is, uh, they're trying to translate, starting to translate the Old Testament too in the same the same bunch of people are doing it, and uh, you get these for a dime, but I'm a Christian, and I give them away, so if you want one of these things, just let me know, and I'll, and I'll let you have it for free. Uh, the first reading will be Psalms 90, verses 1 and 2. Ninetieth Psalm, the first two verses. The subject this morning will be, Who is God? 
Now this is an old, you know, you've heard this from, you know, your little kids days. You've heard, you know, that God is this and God is that. But it's a question among unbelievers that is tearing at their hearts just who God really is. I want to know if there really is a God, if, you know, where he's at, what he's doing, and does he care about me? The question is, what does he care about me? What can I do to get to know him? Does he love me? Does he hate me? Just what is he all about? And what can I really believe? This is an important question so many people were asking. I asked a guy if he's a Christian. He said, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I just don't know what to believe. There's evolution and convolution and restitution and substitution. I don't know what to believe anymore. So this man is confused, and all of us get confused. Even, even the Christians get confused as to just who God is. We don't know. There's a big conflict against us. Is God a God of wrath or is God a God of love? You know, just what is God all about? The endless questions are caused for one reason. Because you and I were created, we were born, for one reason, and that's to know God. We can't know anything until we know God. We're lost until we find Him. So this, this question of finding love, happiness, peace, truth, all of it comes from finding the knowledge of God. And our nation must know God or die. If we don't have a revival in this country in a few years, we're going to lose our nation. We must have a revival. We must come to a personal knowledge of God nationally and individually. It starts with individual and must build to a national knowledge. And if we don't start raising our children, Along godly lines, we're not going to have any children in a few years. We must give them this personal knowledge of God, or we're going to lose them. And our church must have a revival. We cannot hope for a revival. We cannot wish for a revival. We must have a revival. And it better start this year. We've got to have it. We've got to come alive. And I don't mean a couple of weeks of emotionalism. I mean a church on fire for God. In East Africa, there's several church groups that have had revival for 20 years. 20 years of revival with no abatement. We must start this in this country or we're going to lose our church. We're going to lose our country. We're going to lose our kids. We're going to lose everything if we don't have this personal knowledge of God. And it must come quick. And the only way that we're going to set the world on fire for God is to know who God really is. So we as Christians this morning must reevaluate, re reexamine just who our God really is. And that's what the sermon will be about this morning. And the only true description you're going to find of God is in the Bible. The living God, the God that created life, the God with whom we have our being, we live and move and have our being, the little scripture verse we had this morning is very apropos. We live in him, we breathe in him, everything we do is in him. This God is not known. This God is misunderstood today. We think that God is, uh, I don't know, he destroys things. You know, that's, I guess that's the idea that most people have of God. Every natural disaster is always an act of God. You know, in your insurance policy or in your house insurance, if uh, you know lightning strikes or if an earthquake hits or your house is rushed down the river, it's always an act of God. I don't know where they get their ideas, but that's always legislation. There was a man in California who sued God. He had such hard luck, such bad time, he went into the court and sued God. And he lost the case, but uh, he sued God. And we cannot know the truth about God. We cannot really know God with our minds alone. This is sending people to hell because they're trying to find God through the mind, you see. We're going to experience God mentally. Uh, there's a certain intellectual process that must take place to know God, true. But you're not going to find God totally that way. Because our minds are infested with sin, infested with evil, our own lust, all these things that we want. You see, this is what our minds are always on all the time. And you cannot really know God this way because you're going to try to pick God down on your own level. God's going to try to be fit into a little bag that you have. You see, this is going to be our God, and this is not the true God. You can only know the truth about God and the beauty of God and the fullness of God to the heart. Again, this is not an emotional thing only. There's some emotion to it, but it's not just an emotional thing. To know God to the heart, you must believe totally. Your entire being, your mind, your will, your emotions, everything is thrown at God. It's thrown into God. And this is the knowledge of God. It comes to the heart, to the soul. When Christ comes in and gets to your soul, this is the knowledge of God. It takes your whole being, not just one part, your mind or your emotions, the heart, the inside, the totality of it. So if you have your Bibles, reading Psalms 90, the first two verses from the today's English version. Lord, you have always been our home. Before the hills were created, before you brought the world into being, you were eternally God, without beginning or end. Okay, the very first precept of God is God is forever. Before anything was, God was. And after everything is gone, God will be. He is the beginning, the end, the Alpha and Omega. Christ called himself Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This is God. He is all things, all time. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, we find that my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. This gives us a concept of 
it's a, it's a kind of a jolting thought when you're trying to ask God, why did you do this, Lord? You see, I'm having such a hard time. Why did you do this? You know, somebody died. Something happened. Why did you do this, Lord? When you read this verse, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. So let me handle this thing. Because I see the past, I see the present, and I see the future all at one time. It's all in his hand. He looks at every, all concepts of time at one time. We can't understand that. We can't believe this. We have 70 years at best to see time. We study history, you might have just a kind of a fuzzy notion of the past and a fuzzy notion of the future. But our time is the present. God sees all things at the same time. So we find in Psalms 104, the first, uh, the second and third verses, the God of creation. This is a beauty. This is great. This is fantastic. The God of creation. You stretched out the heavens like a tent. You built your home on the waters above. You used the clouds as your chariot, and you walk on the wings of the wind. You know, a lot of people have a hard time in really getting into this six-day creation business. You see, a lot of people really can't. Believe you know maybe six maybe a day was like a million years. So they think this. I don't have that trouble. My trouble is always, why did it take him so long? Why did he take six whole days to create the world? In Psalms 33, 6, he said, the heavens were created with the breath of his mouth. You see, he just breathed, and there was the sky, and there was the stars. And uh, you've heard the story, I'm sure, about the God of creation. He was lonely. And he builds the world. You know, and he takes a handful of stars, slings them against the sky. You see, that's, that's quite a God. That's my God right there. That's the God that I'll fight the devil for. See, that, that's the one that we should, we should worship. But it's just this, this fantastic power of God that he can create things just through his own will. He doesn't have to use tools. He makes his own tools and then creates. Fantastic. In Psalms 139, reading the first two verses and then later reading the 13th verse. In which we'll find that God sees and knows everything about you and I, about, you know, about everybody. Find that, Lord, you have examined me and you know me. You know everything I do. From far away, you understand all my thoughts. Find that there's really no hiding from God. Anyway, you know, there's no secret thought. There's no secret deed. There's nothing that shall not be revealed sometime because God knows everything. He knows what you do, he knows what you think, he knows everything inside of you, outside of you, everything you've done. The sins you forgot about, he remembers. He knows everything. And uh, if we were conscious of this, if we would just had this around us all the time, we'd be better people. We would, but the only time I really, I really blow it, the only time I really blow it is when I lose this presence of God right with me. You know, he's examining everything, he's consulting, I consult him. When I quit consulting him, but when he's not around me anymore, then I, then I mess up. And you know, the Christians we really admire, the people that we really, really do care about, we really do look up to, those who are always close to God, because it brings this morality out of them, it brings this purity out of them. They're not going to, you know that they're going to be the same person when they're by themselves as they are with you. They're not two-faced, you see, because their God's with them all the time, and they act the same way when they're with God all the time, alone and with other people. In verse 13, we find something that is on my heart, and gets to me once in a while, we find these words. You created every part of me. You put me together in my mother's womb. And God knows us before we were born. Before you came out of your mother's womb, you were known by God. Jeremiah the prophet was called to be a prophet, called to be a prophet before he was born, while he was in his mother's womb. God put the bones together. God created Jeremiah and called him to be a prophet even before he was born. And I want to talk a little bit about these abortion laws that we're having today. I think they're from hell, people. I really do. Because God, the Bible says you're a person as soon as you're conceived. As soon as you're put together, you're a person right then. God knows you. God knows who you are right there. And these abortion laws are taking people out and refusing to admit that they're people. But God says they're people, they're people. We don't argue with what God says about them. And some, I know there's some legitimate reasons for these things. There's the health of the mother or some other reason like this. But it's sin to destroy a person. And people are doing this or are going to answer for it. The people are making the laws, the people that are supporting these laws, and the people that are participating in this kind of action will pay because they're taking people and denying that they're people. And I believe we shall pay for this. Psalms 119, 75th verse. 
Psalms 119, 75. I know that your rules are righteous, Lord, and that you punish me because you are faithful. I find in this verse that God is truth and justice. Now, most people in the world hate and fear the Ten Commandments. They hate them. They're afraid of them. You don't want you to talk about them. Don't tell me about the Ten Commandments. They hate them. But the bargain believer loves them. The whole 119th Psalm is about this one thing. I love your word, Jesus. I love your word. I love your commandments. When you punish me, you're doing the right thing. When you give me these laws, these laws are pure and perfect. I love them. This is the born-again believer's attitude towards the laws of God. It's a great love for them. Now, in this world, in this time, we have laws and courts and things like this, and they're always imperfect. You know, good old America, you know, I love America, I really do. I'm developing a deep love for this place. But our laws and our courts are imperfect. As much as we try, as hard as we try to seek the guidance of God, they're imperfect. Uh, you know that some people get punished too much, some people don't get punished enough. But God's laws are always perfect. God's laws are pure. When God punishes you, you, it's exactly for what you deserve. On Judgment Day, again, think about this stripping away of all facade, stripping away of all falseness. Every sin, every deed we've ever done is going to be brought up into the open, and we're going to be weighed good and bad. On Judgment Day, we're going to get exactly what we deserve. And that scares me to death, man, because I deserve to go to hell. I deserve to die eternally. And so do you. So do you. And don't kid yourself. Romans 3.23, all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. Think about your life. You deserve it. I deserve it. We deserve to die. That's the justice of God. It's pure. It's perfect. And we deserve it. Everything we get. But <laughs> that's not, that's not, uh, that's not the real God. That's not the real God. There's three words that describe God better than any any words ever. Three words. And if you don't ever understand these three words, you're not going to understand God. You're not going to understand what God is really all about. The three words are God is love. This describes God better than any other. Three words. Love is God. God is love. This is what the depth of God is all about. This is what the inner core of God is all about. You hear so many preachers say, well, God is love. Yeah, he's love. But, but, God's more than love. Listen, man, there's nothing more than love. Love is it. Love is the beginning the end. Love is it. And this is God. This is what God's all about. But you just said we all deserve to go to hell. You just said we all deserve to go to hell. That's right. That's right. God's standards are set. He's not going to lower them for you or me. And we don't even come close to his standards. We can't even get close enough to God to look at the standards. We can't even get close to the Ten Commandments to look at it. We don't even understand the Ten Commandments. We're, not, we're so far away from his standards, we can't even see it. And God's standards will not be lowered. And to break these standards, to not come up to these standards, is death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We throw that word sin around like a little toy. Sin is death, people. Sin is death. We're going to die because of it. Let's see the real truth about God. God doesn't owe us anything. You haven't done anything in this world to deserve a passing glance from God. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous. There is none righteous. No man even seeks God. Romans 14, 1, no man even seeks God. No man tries to do good. This is, this is you and me. We don't even try. But God... Love is greater than that. God has done everything to keep us out of hell. Everything possible, and that includes, that includes something you and I would never do. That includes sending his only son to die on a bloody cross to save everybody. People, God wants everybody to be saved. He wants the black, the brown. He wants the smart, the dumb, the good, the bad. He wants everybody to be saved. That's why Jesus came to die on the cross. And all a person has to do is trust in Jesus. He didn't have to do it. There's no obligation on Christ to do it. Christ volunteered to do it. He said, I'm laying my life down on my own free will. No man is forcing me to do this. And trusting him totally is to live forever. Romans 5, 7, and 8 says, scarcely for a good man 
scarcely for somebody that's good. We wouldn't die. We wouldn't give up some of our comfort for a good man. But Christ, while we were yet sinners, died for us. This is God's love. This is God's love. In John 14, Philip said to Jesus, Jesus, show us the Father. We'll be happy if you just show us the Father. Jesus said to him, Philip, have I been such a long time with you? Have I been with you so long that you still don't understand what I've been trying to tell you? We've eaten together. You listen to my teachings. You've seen my miracles. Don't you understand anything yet? Jesus, uh, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You want to look, look at God? You want a good, clear picture of God? Look at Jesus Christ. Every time somebody asks me, well, what's God like? Well, look at Jesus. What's, you know, what did he say? Look what Jesus said. This is God. This is a picture of God. This is what it's all about. And a few hours after he said this, he was beaten, spat on. Ragged spikes were drove into his body. He was hung on a cross for the sins of the world. And this, this person, Jesus, is the same person that created the heavens with the breath of his mouth. He spoke when the heavens were. He stretched out the heavens like a tent, the Bible said. Took a handful of stars and flung against the sky. This is Jesus. And he could have, with one, one breath of his mouth, killed his enemy. One breath of his mouth, destroyed. But what kind of sound came out of his mouth when he did speak? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The one, was he a murderer? Rapist? Was he a drug addict? You know, was he some terrible being? No. He was the only begotten Son of God. This is the real God. A while ago we were talking about the God you were created to know. This is the God you were created to know. This is why you were made. This is the truth about God. And you shall know. If it's truth, if you shall know God. You'll know him one way or the other. You'll either know his love personally. It'll come inside of you, cleanse you, make you pure make you holy, you'll know this God, or you'll know the wrath of God. Either you're going to go to heaven, or you're going to go to hell. There is no middle ground. You either love God or you hate Him. You're not indifferent towards God. You're not indifferent towards Him. You love Him with your whole being, or you hate Him with your whole being. This is, this is us. And it's one way or the other. Either reject Him, go to heaven, accept. Go to heaven, reject Him, and die. Go to hell. Romans 10, 9, confess. Lord Jesus, with thy lips, and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. Reject Christ and burn forever. The only sin, there's one sin you're going to die for. The only sin is to reject Jesus. Because if you reject Jesus, your, all those other sins you commit remain on. You reject him, they stay. You accept him, and they're gone. So only one sin, really, is going to send you to eternal damnation. And that is to reject Jesus Christ. Because all sins are wrapped up in this one sin of rejecting Jesus Christ. Let us stand. I'd like everybody to bow their heads, every eye closed, every head bowed, eye closed. I'd like to ask you this morning if you really know the love of God. You really know the love of God. Because if you don't, I'm going to ask you to accept Him this morning. Accept that love. And do the things that God wants you to do. Tell me, Father, if there is someone here who does not know your love, who does not know the comfort that you can give them, Father, they need to know you and they need, need a closer walk. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit, your guidance, your will, get hold of their lives. Open them up make him walk closer to you, Father, to know the truth about you, to know the love about you. In Jesus' name. Now, with our heads continued bowed and our eyes closed, I'd like just the choir to sing the invitation to him. And if there's somebody who needs to know the love of God, who has strange conceptions about God, who fears that he's a God of wrath, but who would like to really know his love, I'm going to ask that you sit forward and Together, perhaps we can find the truth of God and His true love. <laughs>
Thank you all for your attention. Appreciate it. Come tonight and you'll hear the zither. And you'll also hear a sermon on man. That's how I got this morning, the man this afternoon. Uh, David Engel, you think it's in close to decision one way or the other. We can't be neutral. 